Right, but I, you, uh, the apportioning of blame, because anybody uh, watching us would say, okay, you've picked out the chief culprit. You've mentioned other countries, such as Thailand. You've mentioned, and I do believe that there is, as an American, there is a, a significant trade in ivory in your own country. So are you saying one form of abuse is better than another? Because I do believe I've read a, an expansive tome that chronicles the misuse of ivory in the US. Uh, and maybe it might be second of all to the Chinese. Is that untrue? Um, that part is probably untrue. But what, what I can say to you is that in the 19th century and the first part of the 20th century, there's no doubt that the United States and Western Europe were the chief consumers of ivory. Piano keys, billiard balls, combs, brushes, all sorts of things. It was a huge trade. In fact, there's a little town in Connecticut called Ivoryton, uh, where the, uh, the clipper ships coming out of Zanzibar and other parts of the East African coast brought the ivory. So the answer is, you're absolutely right. Now, the biggest trader right now is China. Right. Thailand following. There is no question that the United States is on the receiving end of that. And there's no question that, that the U.S. is, um, is to blame. And I believe that the first thing that, uh, that should happen is the United States should crack down entirely right. so, on, on this so I would internal say, and I would, I would And say that your film is also going to be distributed in the United States with much the same vigor as it was shown in the Philippines. Oh yeah, oh yeah, right. it will have that and, and, and since our conversation is limited, I'm also going back to our responsibility, My, myself being a Kenyan. Uh, we read in the papers every day that right up to the very top echelons of government, there are people involved in this trade. So apart, I go back to my initial premise, it'll be a very hard luck story, but in much the same way as the dodo, the elephant is going to become extinct. Would you accept that as a premise? It'll take time. People like you are going to work tirelessly to make sure it doesn't happen. But the way things are going, it will. Well, in my few short years left, um, I will dedicate myself to making sure that doesn't happen. Uh, I, With I, it, what is your chance of success? Uh, because I, because I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not denying the nobility of the cause. I'm just being, what is the word? Cynical. Okay. Um, I can tell you how, how successful it could be. In, in 1989, Richard Leakey burnt the ivory in this country. It was a symbolic gesture, that, uh, and the smoke of that ivory burn was uh, traveled all the way to the United, to the United States. It, it affected huge changes in the import of ivory in the United States at the time. But most importantly, it targeted Japan, who were the chief consumers at that time. Now, they did shut the trade down. Uh, today, the trade in what they call hankos, these little seals that they have, has been reduced incredibly. So yes, to answer your question, it is possible. And I, and I think it would be possible in China, because unlike Kenya, unlike the United States, unlike so many other countries, all it takes is a word from the top. The word from the top would be, no more buying or selling of ivory all the shops that are government owned and all the other shops not government owned, no selling of ivory. It would just take one word from the top and it could be done. It's not a magic recipe. But in the meantime, what Kenya must do is it must make it absolutely the most heinous social disease of all times to trade in ivory and to poach elephants. Right, okay, so we're going back. I want to stick to Kenya, I want to stick to Kenya. And I'm, th because we hear about world, the layman's perception, uh, organizations like CITES, people in briefcases, meet, you're a filmmaker, you're a writer, that's your, but there, there, there are specialists in the field. What are they doing to sort of say, let's have a worldwide ban? Because my, my niggling argument is that you're picking on the big bad wolf, but there are other people having a whale of a time and ex just discussing the topic. The world hasn't said no to ivory trading, has it? Uh, you know, it is a tragedy. CITES, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, I was there. We showed our film there. Um, they 
spent a day on elephants, all 280 delegates from around the world. It was a ridiculous discussion they had. It was the mechanics for deciding how to decide to sell ivory in the future. None of them addressed the catastrophic problem facing them at the time. Uh, they, they came up with language that essentially targeted eight countries, the Gang of Eight, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda as the suppliers, um, three countries that were part of the transit route, and the two uh, consumer nations, Thailand and China. And, but as I insufficient. saw it, as I saw it, I thought it was a, in, insufficient. a little tap on the back of the hand. Right. And, 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 and so what if they find them really um, uh, in breach of uh, whatever agreement they made? What are they going to do? They have no tools to do it. Nothing at all. So I believe you're right. A lot of guys in suits with briefcases, traveling around the world, living in nice hotels, going to conferences and talking about something in a most extraordinarily disconnected way about something that's happening on the ground now. They're not doing it. So I think there's another way to do it. Right. And we, we, time is not on our side. We have to end with, you said, and I was listening, that you're going to de dedicate the rest of your living days to this project. What are you going to do and how are you going to get, educate others such as myself to join you? Well, I think in Kenya uh, there's a great opportunity. Um, I'm, um, I'm very happy. I've, I've just recently um, been appointed the chairman of Wildlife Direct, um, which, uh, and you've interviewed Dr. Paula Kahumbo, um, who is leading the charge. I think the mo it, it is appalling that all the NGOs in the world haven't done what this small little organization is trying to do, and that is to change the hearts and minds of people and to change the laws related to wildlife crime. These are absolutely critical. And, um, and why, why I'm here is to, uh, because uh, Kenya's first lady, the first time this has ever happened, first lady of this country has come out to support this. We think it's a tremendous move. It comes from the very highest. Um, and we believe that it can change. It can be a part of a system that is going to affect other countries. If Kenya can do it, then I think a lot of other African countries will look to this example and will be inspired. John Hemingway, writer and filmmaker, thank you for inspiring us and thank you for coming on the JSO interview. Thank you so much, John.